Hello again. So the topic for today is melody, uh, which comes after what we just covered, which was rhythm, meter, also uh, some stuff about notating music, how to write it down. Um, and then over on page 36, we get to the section on melody. But before I even get too much into melody, I want to talk about a couple of other things uh, to sort of frame that discussion. Um, first of all, keep in mind that music does not have to have melody. Uh, the book starts out on page 36 by saying, for many of us, music means melody. Well, for many others of us, it doesn't. At least it doesn't necessarily uh, have to have melody. So, for example, I've um, uh, given the example a couple times of, let's say, music like a drum circle, where really there's no melody because there are no pitches. And usually we think of a melody as having distinct pitches. That's actually uh, a nice segue into the definition of melody. Very next sentence in the book. A melody is a series of single tones that add up to a recognizable whole. I'm not too crazy about that definition, but I can't really think of a better one. It's good enough for us. Melody is one of those things uh, like music itself, like art, like love, like peace, or whatever, these terms that we know what they are, but they're so difficult to define. But I think one thing we could definitely agree on is that a melody has to have tones or pitches, but not all music has to have tones or pitches. So it's possible to have music without melody, and not necessarily just percussive music like drum circle. I can think of other you know, for example, you could have sort of atmospheric background sounds uh, that are uh, that have pitches, let's say, um, but don't really have melody because those sounds, those tones, don't add up to a recognizable whole. Right. Um, now, most music that we listen to certainly does have melody, at least certainly most music that we listen to here in the West. And remember what I mean by the West, I mean... Uh, Europe, the Americas, and, and actually Western culture has spread throughout the world. So um, this is another thing. I'm going to be talking about the conventions of melody and harmony and, and other aspects of music within the context of Western music. So this is something to keep in mind. A lot of what I'm going to say today is not universally about all kinds of music. It's about Western music, which happens to be the kind that we are all most familiar with. So if you're hearing me uh, give this lecture in the English language and that's your, your native tongue, then probably you are much more familiar with the conventions of Western music than other types of music. But I just, I, I like to put that out there, that, that uh, especially now, especially let's say for the next couple of lectures, which are going to be fairly kind of in-depth, at least for the level of this class, Music 101, uh, I'm going to be going fairly in-depth into music theory. Um, it's just kind of necessary to, to talk about melody or harmony. It's kind of unavoidable that we're going to get into some technical, nitty-gritty, music theory kind of stuff. Um, and what music theory is, is just this, the attempt to understand the various components of music, elements of music, uh, how they work, and how maybe they generate meaning, or at least how they attempt to generate meaning, significance, how they get, let's say, an emotional reaction out of us, all right? Okay, so before we get too much further into melody, I want to skip ahead a few pages, actually, because there's a, there's a concept that is very much related to melody that I want to get to before we get to melody itself, and that is musical texture. So if you have the ninth brief edition of the Kamian text, and you turn over to page 46. This is where they discuss texture. Um, people use the word texture in relation to music in different ways, uh, again, in a sort of a casual sense, um, but the way that I'm going to talk about it is in a very specific sense. Right? Um, if a piece of music has melody, which we just established not all music has to have melody, but if it does, then there are basically three possibilities regarding the role of melody within a piece of music. Right? Uh, that is, there are three different textures. 
Uh, and those three are monophonic, polyphonic, and homophonic. And they're fairly easy to understand, uh, just from the words themselves. So monophonic, mono means one, phonic has to do with speaking or a voice. So monophonic, a piece of music that is monophonic in texture, has one melodic line and nothing else. So if, for example, if it's your birthday, if I sing happy birthday to you just all by myself, uh, that's monophonic texture. Now, if the entire class sings happy birthday to you, uh, and nobody is singing anything else, nobody is doing anything else, no one's playing the chords on the piano or banging on a drum or whatever, if we are all together singing happy birthday, that's also monophonic texture because there's one melody. Now, there might be a bunch of people singing it, or if we had some, some instruments, if some people were playing instruments and some people were singing, but we were all performing that familiar melody, happy birthday, that would count as monophonic texture. Pretty simple, right? Um, the next one, polyphonic texture, is the one that you are, is the, of these three textures, it's the one that you are probably least familiar with. Unless you are a fan of Renaissance polyphony, or if you're a fan of J.S. Bach, for example, you might never have heard some truly polyphonic music in your life. Um, but for a very long time, it's sort of on and off through different phases of music history, as we'll see uh, when we get to that part of the course, polyphonic texture was considered sort of like the serious texture for serious composers to create serious music. Um, and so it was dominant in several different stylistic eras of Western music. Um, polyphonic music is when you have more than one melody going on simultaneously. Now, there's more to it than that, though, actually, because not only must you have, in order for it to really qualify as truly polyphonic music, not only do you have to have more than one melodic line going on simultaneously, those different melodic lines have to be kind of considered of roughly equal importance to each other. Now, at any given moment, maybe one of the melodic lines is more prominent than another one, but as time goes on, maybe that one will kind of fade into the background and another layer of polyphonic uh, texture, of another melody will sort of come to the forefront. Right. So the idea is, in polyphonic texture, we have two or more melodies going on simultaneously, which are equal in importance to each other, and also more or less independent of each other. Um, it's sort of like, I guess if we were to, to make a comparison to human speech, uh, right now what I'm doing is monophonic texture. I'm just up here by myself speaking, one sentence at a time, uh, one voice all by itself. But if we are having, let's say, a conversation in which we are equals, that's maybe more like polyphonic texture. Of course, we'd have to be talking over each other a little bit because the idea is these melodies are going on simultaneously, two or more melodies going on simultaneously. Um, and if you want to hear an example, uh, you can go to my, go to my uh, playlists and uh, if you find anything in there by J.S. Bach, most of J.S. Bach's music was polyphonic in texture because that was just kind of considered the correct practice for his time. Okay? But there, there are other times, it's not just Bach or just the Baroque era, there are lots of different styles of music that are in polyphonic texture. We'll come back to polyphonic texture uh, in most detail when we get to the Renaissance and the Baroque era. The last one, homophonic texture, is the one that you are probably most familiar with because pretty much all popular music and lots of other kinds of music as well is in homophonic texture. In homophonic texture, we have one melody that is sort of like considered to be the most important thing. It's sort of like the lead actor in a drama. But we have other stuff going on in the background that plays a supporting role, and we call that accompaniment. That accompaniment could be, it could take many different forms. So for example, um, if I play, if I sing happy birthday and I play the chords on the piano, that's homophonic texture. It's understood 
that the stuff in the background is not as important as the melody. Right. So for example, and I use this little piece a lot because it's something you've probably heard before. This familiar little uh, piano sonata by Mozart. <laughs> listening to that, what's familiar to them is this. That's the most important thing. That's what Mozart wanted you to, to hear more than this. This is playing a supporting role. It's providing harmony and a little bit of forward motion, right? But it's not as important as the melody. If, if you were to ask someone, oh, how's that Mozart sonata go? They wouldn't start singing that accompaniment. They would sing the melody. So, uh, three types of texture, monophonic, polyphonic, and homophonic. And they all have to do with melody and the role of melody in a piece of music. So now let's go back and talk about what melody is a little bit more. Back to page 36. So one thing, right, right off the bat, you kind of could infer this from what I just talked about relating to texture. If we have a piece of music that has a melody... Not all music has to, but if we do have a melody, it is understood that the melody is the most important thing. It's, it's the thing that's in the foreground. There may be other stuff in the background. There may not be. Uh, but in a, it's just sort of understood. This is something we understand, I think, intuitively. That in a piece of music which has melody, the melody is the most important thing. It's sort of like the, the main character, again, comparing to other works of art, let's say literature or drama or whatever. So again, monophonic texture, we have one main character and nothing else. Uh, in homophonic texture, we have one main character, but we have stuff going on in the background, maybe supporting characters, whatever. Um, and uh, in polyphonic texture, we could say we have several main characters who interact with each other and are, let's say, of more or less equal importance overall. Okay. Now, the other thing, uh, as soon as we get into talking about melodies, remember we're talking about pitches. We can't really have a melody without pitches. But as I, as I mentioned earlier, when I talked about pitch, um, in a sense, it's really the intervals that are more important than the pitches. Remember, intervals are the distance, although it's not really a distance. We think of it as a distance, but it's a difference in frequency from one pitch to another. Right. And when we listen to a piece of music that has a melody, what really gives that melody significance, what makes it uh, memorable to us, what makes us able to recognize it, etc., are not really the pitches themselves. It's the intervals between the pitches. You can think of pitches and intervals as sort of like the dots in a connect-the-dot picture versus the lines. Okay. Um, it, it, it's the lines in between the dots that really make up the picture. And uh, I can demonstrate this to you that, that, that it's really the, the uh, pitches, it's really the, the intervals and not the pitches. Happy birthday is a good example. I can play happy birthday, let's say, in the key of C. And I'll talk about what we mean by that, in the key of C. It's hard to talk about one thing at a time because there's so many interrelated aspects. But I'm going to play... Happy birthday in the key of C. Even if I play it, by the way, in the key of C, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm starting on the pitch C. Actually, if I play happy birthday in the key of C, the note I would start on is G. Okay. Nonetheless, here it is. So there's happy birthday in the key of C, you all recognized it. And what was the texture? Homophonic, because I had melody in my right hand and I had accompaniment in my left hand. Right. Uh, but I could play it in a different key and use all different pitches. I oh, messed up a little bit there, sorry. Uh, I could play it in the key of D. You get the idea. I'm using different pitches each time, but I'm keeping the intervals the same. I'm keeping the interval pattern. Um, when I play Happy Birthday, I'm not really thinking of notes. 
I'm thinking of different intervals. Now, the book talks about intervals in a very general way. Small intervals we call steps, larger intervals we call leaps. Well, how small, how large? Well, a step, there, there are two kinds of steps, half steps and whole steps, and they are the two smallest intervals that are possible on a piano. Right? So for example, happy birthday starts out with a whole step. Actually, it starts with a repeated note, and then it goes up a whole step, back down a whole step. Right? And when I play happy birthday, I'm thinking of a pattern of intervals that I can apply to any note, as long as I'm sharp with quick with my intervals. Um, the smallest interval, by the way, is a half step, and that's the distance from any key on the piano to the key that is immediately next door, whether it's a white key or a black key. And there are actually only two places on the piano every octave where we have a half step between two white keys. All the rest of them are between a white key and a black key. And by the way, when we're talking about intervals, it doesn't matter if we are going from one note up to another note, or we're going down to another note, or we're playing at the same time. Either way, we'd call it an interval, and we would say, in this case, it's a whole step. All of those are whole steps, the relationship between those notes. Or here's some half steps, up a half step, and then for that same note, down a half step. Um, anything larger than a whole step is considered a leap. And if this were a music theory class, we'd have to get into much more detail. If you were music majors, we would go through all the different intervals. You would have to memorize them uh, by how many half steps each of them contain. So for example, the whole step is two half steps. Uh, the minor third is three half steps. The major third is four half steps. We won't need to get into that for Music 101, but just to, again, demonstrate, when I am playing Happy Birthday, I'm not thinking of the notes, I'm thinking of the intervals, because if I think of the intervals, I could play it in any key. The intervals of Happy Birthday's melody, by the way, go like this. Starting note, repeat that note, up a whole step, down a whole step, up a perfect fourth, down a half step, down a major third, repeat that note, up a whole step, down a whole step, up a perfect fifth, down a whole step, down a perfect fourth, repeat that note, up an octave, down a minor third, down a major third, down a half step, down a whole step, up a minor sixth, repeat that, down a half step, down a major third, up a major second or whole step, back down a whole step. And then there are of course some chords that I have to play in the left hand, but uh, if, I, if I know that pattern, I can start it on any note. The notes don't really matter. It's the intervals that matter. Now, watch what happens if I change. If I start to change the intervals, now it starts to sound different. I'm just going to change one interval. All right? Well, I'm going to change one of the notes, to, which in, in turn changes the intervals. It's like moving one of the dots in my connect the dots picture. What if I started out with a half step instead of a whole step? but played all the rest of the intervals or the notes the same. Now, probably some of you recognize what, what that does. It, it it's, makes it sound sad and gloomy somehow. What I'm doing is, just by changing that one interval, I am implying that I am in the minor mode instead of the major mode. And be, you know, because we've all grown up listening to Western music, for some reason we associate the major mode with happy stuff and the minor mode with sad and gloomy stuff, so happy birthday suddenly sounds kind of gloomy. It's like the morning after your 21st birthday. And you're thinking about those 21 jello shots, which seemed like such a good idea at the time. Uh, okay, so intervals are, to review, distances that are not really distances, but we think of them as distances between pitches, difference in pitch between two different pitches, and we have small ones called steps, larger ones called leaps. In most melodies, we tend to have more steps than leaps. Uh, composers, either consciously or subconsciously, uh, tend to have more steps than leaves for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's easier to sing 
steps than leaps. That is, it's easier to sing them and stay on pitch. And a lot of what we do uh, if we're writing a melody has to do with what is singable. Even if you're writing for an instrument, um, good composers especially tend to think in terms of the human voice and, um, for example, this is one of the reasons why uh, people often have problems with the national anthem, uh, the Star Spangled Banner, because it's, it's got a lot of leaps in it right off the bat, right? Oh, say can you see by, all of those are leaps, the dawns, and then finally we get a couple of steps in there, by the dawns, er, big leap, Lelai. And if we have a lot of leaps like that, it's sort of like, uh, use another analogy, like gymnastics. If you're leaping around all the time, you have to stick the landing. And the equivalent in music is staying on pitch, all right? Uh, this is why so many people get so out of tune when they try and sing the Star Spangled Banner. Or think of like, think of uh, running up a staircase, uh, a step at a time versus leaping up, skipping steps, maybe skipping two steps, not just one step. It's harder to do, harder to stick that landing, right? The other reason that composers tend to favor steps over leaps is that leaps are somehow inherently more expressive just because they're bigger. And you might say, well, if they're more expressive, shouldn't we have more of them? Mm, actually not. What we should do is we should hold them in reserve for special moments. Okay. The bigger the leap, the more dramatic, the more expressive it is. So we don't want to kind of wear it out. We want to hold that in reserve. And, and again, a great example of this, happy birthday. Um, remember all those intervals, right? Start a note, up a step, back down a step, perfect fourth. There's our first leap. Down a step, down a major third. Now notice in the second phrase of the melody, that leap gets a little bit bigger. It was a perfect fourth before, now it's a perfect fifth. And now we feel like we're building up to something. And here it is, the octave, big, dramatic, expressive interval. And it's right there at the climax of the song, right? And then we never get an interval that big again. Mostly steps and small intervals, right? So whoever wrote Happy Birthday, I should know that, but whoever wrote Happy Birthday uh, kind of saved the octave for the sort of the climax of the melody. Um, okay, so I, I've already, I, again, it's hard to even talk about these things without uh, putting terms out there that you might not have gotten around to defining yet. So for example, I talked about phrases. I used the word phrase in there. Um, most melodies, not all, but most melodies tend to be broken up into phrases in the same way that when we speak, we tend to speak in sentences. And when we are reading out of a book, we can see we have sentences and then we have periods at the end of the sentences or question marks, some kind of punctuation mark. And then we have another sentence. We have similar kind of pattern in music. The sentences we call phrases. And the punctuation marks, which kind of define, literally define the uh, the sentences or the phrases, we call cadences. And just like in language where we have different types of punctuation marks to give different emphasis or different inflections or different meanings, we have the same thing in music. We have many different types of cadences. And if you were one of my music majors, you would have to learn all of these different cadences um, and what their function is, all that stuff. I am I'm not going to lay that on you, but the book does generalize into what they, what they call open cadences and closed cadences. It's actually much more complex than that, but generally speaking, there are some cadences that sound kind of like, more like a question mark, and therefore they create a sense of expectation that more must follow, that sort of like the question must be answered, right? So there are some cadences that are more like question marks, and then there are other cadences that are more like periods or exclamation marks that give a sort of a sense of finality. And we can see this again in good old happy birthday, right? So we have four short little phrases in happy birthday. Here's the first one. That cadence, did it sound more like closed or open? Did it sound like 
there must be more that follows. Now, you all know happy birthday, so you know there is more that follows, but in fact, this is an open cadence. It's what we call a half cadence, technically, because it's a cadence on the dominant chord. Don't worry about that. As we move on to the next phrase, that's a closed cadence. So we have sort of like the question mark being followed by the period in the next phrase. And in fact, we could just stop there and go home, really. That if, if happy birthday were shorter, just be like, thank you very much, good night. But there's more, okay, right? Open cadence. Closed cadence. And this final cadence is the strongest cadence, uh, the most assertive, the most final, obviously because it's at the end, but it's what we call a perfect authentic cadence. Perfect authentic cadence is when you have the five chord in root position going to the one chord in root position and the tonic of the key in the melody. And that lets everybody know it's definitely over. That's it. Okay. Uh, again, some, some terms in there that I will define a little bit later on, but um, phrases are like sentences, cadences are like the punctuation marks at the end of musical sentences. Um, why do we have phrases anyway? Why do we need to break up a melody into these uh, segments? It's probably for the same reason that we break up our speech into sentences with punctuation marks. It's because we need to breathe, right? Um, again, remember what, what composers do when they write melodies, even if they're not necessarily writing for the human voice, they tend to do things that are more singable. And when we sing, we need to breathe. So we need to have resting places. We need to have a, a melody that's not gonna just go on and on and on and on like a run-on sentence and make you blue in the face. We need to pause every once in a while, take a breath, and start a new sentence, a new phrase. Okay, um, the book also mentions that we've got a couple of terms in here, and I would urge you to, to, as you're going through the book, you know, just read it, maybe your first time, but read it over again, and pay special attention to the words that are in bold print or italics. Make sure you understand the definitions of those terms. If you have problems uh, understanding any of the definitions the book gives, please feel free to email me and I will help you out. But there's a couple terms here, legato and staccato. Legato simply means connected, the notes in a melody being connected to each other. Staccato means sort of short, spiky, separated. So this has really more to do with the way a melody could be performed rather than necessarily a melody itself. It has to do with performance style. So usually when we sing, we tend to sing legato. That's kind of like the default, right? We connect the different sounds, the different notes, uh, the different uh, syllables of the words we're singing, if we're singing words, to each other. Um, nobody would sing like happy birthday, like happy birthday to you. That would be staccato, right? We do see a lot of staccato on instruments, um, for example, on violins, if you, if you read the section on instruments, you know there's a special technique on violins for plucking the strings rather than drawing the bow across them. We call that pizzicato. And sometimes the violins will do pizzicato with their left hand, sometimes they'll do it with their right hand. Um, so pizzicato is a way of doing staccato notes on the violin, but staccato simply means short, separated notes. Legato means longer, connected notes. Um, now, Moving on, and I'm just kind of, again, working off the book. The book goes into some detail. They use uh, Happy Birthday and Mary Had a Little Lamb and My Country Tis of Thee to demonstrate some of their points. Um, one thing that we will see over and over again in vocal music of all eras is that composers will very often, uh, if, if, it's a, if it's a piece that has words, and those words are being sung, right? So this only applies to vocal music. Composers will very often make an effort to have the notes themselves somehow reinforce the same meaning as the words. 
And we call this either tone painting, sometimes text painting or word painting. And that is any attempt to uh, illustrate or highlight or reinforce the meaning of the words through purely musical devices, through, let's say, uh, pitches or intervals or even rhythms. Okay? A great example of this is uh, Somewhere Over the Rainbow by Harold Arlen, uh, which they, again, is one of, one of your uh, examples, musical examples. I'm over here on page 38 and 39. Somewhere Over the Rainbow is kind of an interesting melody because it starts with a large leap, the leap of an octave, right? And that's, remember, that's kind of unusual. Remember I said that composers tend to uh, use uh, more steps than leaps and they hold the leaps in reserve. So this is kind of an unusual thing to have that octave right at the beginning of the melody. Somewhere over the rainbow. But look what it does. It makes you think of a rainbow, especially because we usually kind of slide. If we, if we try and sing that, we end up kind of sliding because it's just easier to do than to really jump and land on that octave. We tend to slide a little bit. Somewhere over. Look at that. There's a rainbow shape there, right? The notes themselves, the pitches, that Harold Arlen chose to set those words deliberately, obviously, trying to make us think of a rainbow, something that arches up and then settles back down. Right. So that's an example, and once you're aware of this phenomenon of text painting, you, you find it all over the place uh, in music. One of my favorite examples, and can you hear my bad Beatles impression, um, from It's Getting Better. I used to get mad at my school the teachers who taught me weren't cool. You're holding me down, turning me around, filling me up with your rules. So notice on holding me down, the melody goes down, and then filling me up, the melody goes up. Uh, once you're aware of this, you hear this all over the place. And sometimes it's done in a more obvious way. Sometimes it's very subtle and very clever. Um, as we go through these different eras of music history, history, and as we look at examples of vocal music, I'm going to point out many examples of text painting or tone painting. And actually, while I'm, while I'm saying that, it occurs to me that all of this stuff that I'm talking about now is more, uh, is stuff that we're going to have to retain as we go forward into the next chapters on music history. So right now we're in the elements of music unit. Um, and even though these, these different units I don't really test in a cumulative way, as we go forward, you're going to need to remember these terms that I'm teaching you now because those are the terms I'm going to use when I talk about music of different eras. So this uh, unit that we're in now is maybe more cumulative than the others. Right? So I don't expect you to, it would be a bad thing for you to say, okay, I've got this test coming up. I've got to remember you know, what intervals are, what steps and leaps are, what word painting is. But then I can forget all of that once the test is over. No, you have to remember that stuff because those are the words that we are going to use to talk about music. And you won't understand what I'm saying if you can't remember the meanings of those terms. So make sure that this stuff stays in your brain for a while. Okay, other stuff having to do with melody. Well, um, actually the, the, uh, the book from here gets more into, uh, into harmony um, after the section on melody and word, so text painting uh, is covered here on page 40. Then they get into harmony. And um, melody and harmony are obviously uh, interrelated. Right? Um, so before going too much farther into, into talking about harmony, that should probably be the subject of a completely different lecture. But I will say that everything that I've said about melody... And everything that I'm going to say about harmony um, assumes that we are talking about a particular uh, style within Western music. So forget even the, the Western music versus music from other parts of the world. Okay, we've already established that. But even within Western music, everything that the book is going to say about 
is going to say about harmony, and pretty much everything it said about melody as well, most of it, pertains to a specific period within Western music, uh, which we might call, uh, or let's say a specific style, uh, which we might call tonal harmony, sometimes called common practice tonal harmony, and the era of common practice tonal harmony goes from roughly mm, the mid to late 1500s, let's say, up to, well, it depends, up to uh, maybe about the year 1900 or so, if we're talking about quote-unquote classical music, but then well beyond that if we're talking about popular music. So uh, all the music that you would listen to on the radio, if you just turn on the radio and you, and you just go to a random station, all of that music pretty much follows the rules, or let's say the practices, of common practice tonal harmony. Right? Um, in fact, if you were to study music theory, if you were to take my music theory class, I remember what music theory is, it's the attempt to understand sort of the materials of music, how they relate to each other, how they work, and how they sort of generate meaning or how they generate emotions in us. If you were to study music theory, you would have to buy a book called Tonal Harmony. Most of the music theory class, even though there are other aspects of music theory besides harmony, harmony is the biggest, most complex, and there are lots of different uh, ways that you could create harmony. But this book and the music that you've listened to is mostly going to be in one particular way, which we call tonal harmony. Well, what do you mean by tonal harmony? I mean, we're talking about tones here, right? We're talking about pitches, which are tones, and yeah, isn't all harmony tonal harmony? No, it's not, right? There is such a thing called atonal harmony. In fact, there are various different types of atonal harmony. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean harmony without tones? No, there are tones in atonal harmony. Here's what, here's what we mean by tonal music versus non-tonal music. Tonal music is music that is in a certain key, right? Well, what do we mean by that exactly? What we mean is there is one tone that is that rules all the others, sort of like the one ring. Right? There is one tone that is sort of like the center of gravity for a piece of music which is in a key or which is tonal. There's one tone that's more important than all the others. We call it the tonic. All of the other tones, they have names too, like the dominant or the subdominant or the leading tone, but all of those other tones like, sort of exist in, in relation to the tonic. Um, I, I'm thinking in terms of like, you know, like solar system analogies. There's lots of other analogies that are, that are useful. Sometimes uh, music theory teachers will talk about baseball. They will say like, the tonic is home plate. You start out there and you make a journey and hopefully you come back to home plate. That's your goal. That's your starting point and your ending point. Uh, another way we could think about it is sort of like pieces on a chessboard. Right? And the tonic is sort of like the king. Right? And there are other pieces that can do certain things, but they all exist in relation to the king. Their job is to protect the king in the case of chess. Um, but the king is the most important piece. Right? So... Uh, that's what we're talking about. In fact, what happened around 1900 is that certain composers, not all, but certain composers basically kind of got tired of using this style of tonal harmony, of writing music that's in a certain key, in the key of D, in the key of G. And uh, they, they kind of rebelled against this idea of one tone being more important than all the others. Why not make all the tones, for example, equally important, right? Um, there are various different systems that composers use to try and avoid tonal harmony, to make atonal music, and then eventually to try and replace it with of some other system of organization. And again, we're not going to get too much into that, but I just want to say that, again, I want to stress that the things the book talks about are not the only way that music, that melodies can be made or that harmony can be made. It's just the way that we're most familiar with. The music that we listen to tends to be in a certain key, 
in the key of G, in the key of C, and all that we're saying, if we say that something's in the key of G, is that G is the most important note. There are other notes, but they all kind of relate to G. G is the thing that's holding all this together. It's the tonic. Also, we tend to, in addition to making one note more important, we tend to use one of two different scales in Western music. At least we have for the past 500 years. Uh, and those are the major scale and the minor scale. Now, right off the bat, those words major and minor are problematic in music because they are used to describe many different things that aren't necessarily the same. Of course, it's literal main, meaning major means big and minor means small. If you have a major problem, that's different if you have a minor problem, right? But in music, it means, those terms mean several different things depending on whether we're talking about, for example, intervals or scales or chords, right? Um, so the major and minor scale are just two. In fact, the minor scale has three slightly different versions, but... Again, let's put that aside for a minute. Are just two of the possible scales that we could have in music. And there are thousands, I mean, who knows, maybe an infinite number of possible scales. What is a scale? A scale is basically just a series or a set of pitches that is usually a, a set where each of the different pitches are separated by either a whole step or a half step from each other doesn't have to be that way, but it usually works out that way. So for example, the major scale is basically just a series of notes, or you could think of it as a pattern of intervals, because no matter what note I start on, as long as I keep that pattern of intervals the same, I will get the major scale. Same thing for the minor scale. Right? And this is why we have, we take these two ideas and we combine them together. This is the basic idea of tonal harmony. We have a tonic, a keynote that we choose. Could be any one of these notes. I choose that one, and that's gonna be the most important note. And then I choose one of these two particular scales, major or minor. And I will have a piece that's in the key of, let's say, G major or C minor, right? And that becomes sort of like the, the tonal region within which uh, my music exists. Now, at some point during this music, I might modulate to a different key. That would be like journeying from one region to another. I might modulate from the key of G minor to the key of D major. Right. Um, I might also have a change of mode. In fact, right there I had a change of mode. I might go from, I might, for example, go from G minor to G major. And in that case, I would be keeping the same tonic, which is G. I'm still in the key of G, but I've changed mode. I've gone from the minor mode to the major mode. Mode in music and scale mean basically the same thing. Scale and mode, these are words that we can use pretty much interchangeably. Okay, so that idea uh, the idea of tonal harmony, the basic principle of tonal harmony, uh, that you pick a key, that becomes the most important tone, and you choose one of these two scales, lots of other scales out there, but these two are the two that sort of won out in Western music, that have been dominant over all the others for the past 500 years. Uh, and then you are writing tonal music. All right, and this underlies both melody and and harmony. So I just kind of wanted to establish that before I go on to talk about harmony, which will be the subject of the next lecture. I think I'm out of time here, so we'll leave that for next time. See you then.